I think we can start. Uh, um, good afternoon, um, good evening, or good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this session of the Global Deal Masterclass series on sound industrial relations. Um, the session of today will focus on workplace cooperation. And for this purpose, we gathered a number of experts and practitioners, including from the International Labor Organization, as well as from the International um, Training Center of the ILO. Um, welcome back also to those of you who were with us last week when we launched this uh, masterclass series with a session on grievance handling. Um, as some of you know, with this program, we want to support global deal partners to strengthen key industrial relations institutions, including workplace cooperation, collective bargaining, and grievance handling. And for this reason, uh, we partnered with the International Training Center of the ILO and developed uh, a virtual capacity building program. Um, and today, uh, during this session, um, we will uncover the new Industrial Relations Global eToolkit. And in particular, we will discover the new self-guided e-learning tool on workplace cooperation. These training tools will be available um, as free resources on the eCampus, the e-learning platform of the International Training Center of the ILO. And you should have received already by email some instructions on how to uh, access the materials. And, um, um, and how to use them and sign up to the campus. In any case, my colleagues will then uh, later explain how to, how to use them. And so um, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Silvan Baffi, um, Senior Program Officer at the International Training Center of the ILO. And Silvan has been working with us, has been our key partner in designing and implementing the Masterclass series, and uh, will now take over the moderation of this session. So over to you, Silvan. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, this afternoon in Torino, and uh, to be to have a chance to moderate this uh, session on uh, workplace cooperation. So uh, welcome, everyone, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to see you. Uh, before we start, just a kind reminder, even if after, uh, uh, let's say, for many of us, many Zooms, we know about this uh, meeting etiquette, just a, 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 a small uh, reminder to please mute your microphone if you are not speaking. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, observations uh, for uh, the speakers, please use the Zoom chat box and uh, we will read your comments and we will try to respond to your comment. And uh, as you're aware, the webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the Global Deal website so that you can access it and uh, you can see it. So uh, this, those are the rules that we would like very much to enforce to make sure that we have a conducive environment for this uh, meeting and, uh, uh, and that we can take uh, the most of it. So before I give the floor to the first speaker of today, uh, a small um, uh, a reminder also of the agenda and what we'd like to do by to, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first session uh, will be presented by my colleague Christopher Land Kaslaskas, who is the uh, labor relations and collective bargaining specialist at the ILO, and he will present what the ILO is doing to promote workplace cooperation. So that will be the first intervention. It will be uh, followed by a different example of what the ILO is, uh, is doing and in what is happening in our different member states. The first uh, the, of these interventions will be done by uh, John Richard, who is, is working for the ILO Decent Work Team for East and Southeast Asia and the Pacific. He's based in Bangkok and is a senior social dialogue and labor administration specialist. And my colleague, Andy Bart, who is a legal specialist in the Better Work program, will tell us about the ILO program called Better Work and will tell us about what Better Work is doing to uh, uh, promote and strengthen workplace cooperation in the different countries where the program uh, is operating. Once we have a better idea of what the uh, ILO is doing and uh, policy, we'll be happy to share and to show uh, to you what has been announced by Andrea our new self-guiding e-learning training course on workplace cooperation. Uh, it has been very recently released. We are very happy to share it with you and to show you what uh, you can do and what we can do with this tool. So I'll be happy to show you uh, this tool. And then uh, we'd like to have some interactive discussions. We'd like to hear from you. We'd like to collect examples. We'd like to have a common reflection about workplace cooperation and how it works and the benefits it can bring. So uh, we hope that the last part of this webinar will be interactive. And we are very, very uh, eager 
to listen uh, to you. Uh, we'll be having some um, group work where you will be able to select your preferred room and you will be able in each room to select and to discuss, to, you'll be able to discuss a specific uh, topic. Uh, room number one will be about the enabling conditions for effective workplace cooperations and what stands in the way of effective workplace cooperation. We hope that you will come to this room and share many examples. The second room will be looking specifically at COVID-19 and the role of workplace cooperation, and we'd like very much to get examples of workplace cooperation as a tool to mitigate the pandemic and um, uh, especially uh, possibly on safety and health. And then uh, room number three uh, will be about trying to collect and try to listen to your success stories regarding workplace cooperation. So uh, you will be able to select your room, you will see, uh, we will guide you in order for you to select your room. But we would like you, we would like this uh, webinar just not only being us to talk, but actually to be a common uh, reflection and discussion. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for um, for uh, for uh, attending this uh, webinar. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, give the floor to my colleague, Chris Landkarskas. is working in Geneva in the uh, inclusive uh, labor market, labor relations, and working conditions branch as a labor relations and collective bargaining specialist. And Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sylvain. And I'm really excited to not be the first person who not have muted him or not have tried to speak while he was muted. So um, it's really good to be here. Thanks very much to uh, the ITCILO and to the Global Deal uh, Partnership for putting together this uh, this event. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with everybody again this week and to talk a little bit about uh, the a very very critical subject for the promotion of broader social dialogue, and that's that's workplace cooperation. Uh, I'm not going to take too, too long. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the ILO does, but I'm really going to leave room for my colleagues, John, Anne, and hopefully some of the enterprise advisors and colleagues from the Better Work program to speak in uh, real concrete terms about some of the things that have been going on on the ground in countries. So, but I, I think it is useful to sort of start giving a bit of uh, historical uh, and, and sort of foundational background here. Um, the ILO's approach to just about everything is uh, that we have international labor standards uh, on subjects, right? So the ILO is very much a standards setting, a standard supervisory, and a standards-based organization. So when we look at workplace cooperation of the, from, from the point of view of the ILO, we're really looking at how workplace cooperation can contribute to and not undermine the importance of respecting, promoting, and realizing the fundamental principles and rights of freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining. We talked about these last week, and these are enshrined in Conventions 87 and Convention 98, which I'm sure, uh, with which I'm sure many of you are very uh, well aware. These conventions uh, speak to the rights of workers and employers to foreign and join organizations, the rights of these organizations to function freely and to promote voluntary collective bargaining on terms and conditions. There are other international labor standards that actually complement these two fundamental uh, standards uh, in relation to industrial relations. There's actually a whole panoply of different standards on industrial relations. But for our purposes, what we look at here is the cooperation at the level of the undertaking recommendation, the workers representatives convention and its accompanying recommendation, and then the communications within the undertaking recommendation. But just to say before we move on to the next slide, I think it's important that we, uh, we, we, we differentiate between the two standards that I talked about earlier. These are again, freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining. These are fundamental. Again, by virtue of a country's participation or uh, membership in the ILO, the constitution uh, requires that they respect, promote, and realize these standards. These are fundamental. When we talk about workplace cooperation or social dialogue more generally, these aren't considered uh, fundamental standards, but they are complementary to, and they help to sort of build the foundation for these, uh, these fundamental standards. Next slide, please. So how is workplace cooperation defined? Well, if we look at the terms of the recommendation that I mentioned about uh, just now, 
Workplace cooperation is defined in terms of what it is and what it's not. For a long time, I was actually just putting the entire uh, content of the standard on the um, on the screen just because it was fun to be able to take an international labor standard and put it on a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, very few of them actually fit there. But this is actually one of the shortest um, international labor standards that exist. It's really just two main operative paragraphs. The first one giving a definition and the second talking about how these things can actually uh, come to pass. So it talks about, it defines workplace cooperation as consultation and cooperation between employers and workers within the undertaking, within the, uh, the company on matters of mutual concern. And really importantly, it, it doesn't just, it spends a very short time talking about what it is, but then immediately moves to what it's not. And this is very important to underline that defining workplace, workplace cooperation also talks about the fact that it's not dealing with subjects that are normally within the scope of collective bargaining or normally dealt with by other machinery concerned with the determination of terms and conditions of employment. Why is this? I think one of the fundamental reasons for this is, and there's a, a number of different reasons for this that I'll get into a little bit more in a minute, but one of the fundamental reasons for this is that there's a, fun, there's a real difference, a substantive difference between negotiation or what goes into negotiation, which implies a joint decision, and consultation, which is where the, one of the first terms in the, in the definition here, where management ultimately decides. Next slide, please. So it's important to look at this in, in historical terms, right? So when you look at the development of any standards, any ILO standards related to industrial relations, what you'll see is that they are necessarily broad. This is a necessary uh, reality because it, they're, they're intended to capture very diverse, very varying um, customs, traditions, and systems. Oftentimes you'd see uh, effective workplace cooperation mechanisms develop in systems where you've got centralized bargaining. And otherwise you have, in other words, you have terms and conditions, wages, working time, working conditions that are, central, that are set at the national or sectoral level. And then the workplace cooperation mechanisms were set up to help adjust in systems where it provided for coordination between enterprise level and uh, higher level bargaining or implementing those, those, those agreements at the enterprise level and making the relationship work. Also, you have uh, workplace cooperation that develops in enterprise dominant bargaining systems. In other words, in industrial relations traditions where the majority of collective bargaining takes place at the enterprise level. This can result in some issues that you'll see uh, some of my colleagues point to uh, in, in, in their presentations as well. In order to address the fact that it's very broad, what these standards do is they are intentionally, uh, 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 again, quite broad. But from the beginning, from the very, very earliest stages, you see that there were safeguards that were inserted into the standards themselves, into accompanying re resolutions, or into what are called the travaux, the preparatory works that lead to the development of standards. And in this case, it really focused on three things. The first is, ensuring and supporting the growth and development of collective bargaining. Again, getting back to the fundamental point of uh, Convention 98 and the fundamental principles and rights at work. Second is making sure that you retain the ex certain issues that are the exclusive prerogative of trade unions. You actually see this in the development of Convention uh, 135, where it says very specifically that uh, there are certain uh, prerogatives that, that governments may wish to set aside as exclusive prerogatives of trade unions and collective bargaining being one of the most important ones. And then that these, the, the existence of these representative structures or worker representatives that are not associated with the union are not being used to undermine trade unions or trade union representatives. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, not to put too, too much uh, information in front of you, but I found this quote from the International Labor Conference in 1970, where they were in the process of discussing uh, the Convention on Worker Representatives, very instructive. It talked about the fact that it was the general feeling of the committee that this is, again, the tripartite committee that brought together employers and worker representatives and governments to adopt this convention and recommendation. The general feeling of the committee 
that the definition should be such as to cover the wide variety of national practices. It was also felt that this definition should be worded in such a way that could not be used as an argument against the institutional functioning of trade union representatives in countries where by tradition, the interest of workers at the undertaking are looked after by the unions, as well as, and I think this is per particularly uh, important, and I'd like to see if some of us can uh, reflect on this, this last point in the group work, as well as in those developing countries where trade unions are still weak and need strengthening. So even back in the, in the earliest period of the development of international standards in this subject, there was a lot of uh, care taken to ensure that the existence of or the development of workplace cooperation was not being used as a means of undermining those uh, countries where uh, uh, collective bargaining or trade unions had not yet um, been able to you know, establish a sure enough footing. Next uh, slide, please. So some guidance was actually provided at the point where we adopted this very, very short two paragraph uh, recommendation on cooperation at the level of the undertaking, that same committee proposed a resolution to the International Labor Conference. And here, I'm not gonna go through absolutely every point here because of, because of time, but I wanted to put this here and you'll all have a chance to receive this uh, separately, but just to highlight one or two of the, the salient points here, the ILC committee actually said that uh, they, they wanted to come up with some guidance that would help to accompany this recommendation and ensure that it was actually going to result in the kinds of uh, workplace cooperation mechanisms that they had in mind. The first principle, and this is very important and often overlooked in reality, is that workers' representatives should be freely appointed or recalled by the workers themselves. This is either done through a representative trade union or in the absence of a union by the workers themselves. You also see in here the fact that management had a responsibility to facilitate the proper functioning of these bodies through premises or possibly even staff, through regular information provided on the activity of the undertaking, their plans, general information as well on the economic and technical situation of the company. And also you see that they're looking at allowing worker representatives to perform these functions without loss of pay and ensuring that there was protection against discrimination. Next slide, please. So to wrap up on my, uh, on my part, um, I'll just say that uh, the ILO, you're, gonna, you're about to hear in depth what the ILO has been doing to support the development of workplace cooperation. But I think we can look at it as the ILO support that's provided comes in, 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 in two main areas, in two main categories. The first is technical advice or technical assistance. This can be provided to governments uh, when they're amending or considering amendments to their legal regulatory or institutional frameworks. Um, it can also be provided to the social partners who might be thinking about how to improve workplace cooperation in general within a company or within a sector. We've also provided advice and assistance to brands and other partnerships such as in the context of global framework agreements on how social dialogue and, and workplace cooperation can help to promote uh, good industrial relations. And when we do this, we're usually doing it all in line, as I said before, uh, with international labor standards and international practice. The second really important thing, which is why we're all here today, is that we provide uh, support through capacity building. Sylvain's gonna talk to you about the uh, IR toolkit and the self-guided uh, modules that uh, we've been developing uh, with uh, the support of the, of the and partnership with the Global Deal. But just to say here, you can look at both longer term capacity building, and this is done through our development cooperation projects where we're actually going in depth in country, working with the, the partners um, at country level. And uh, Better Work is one very good example of this. We also have support to country program outcomes and decent work country programs where our specialists in decent work teams are actually supporting countries, constituents, uh, et cetera, in accompanying them in longer term uh, capacity building uh, efforts. Also, we can provide more punctual training opportunities either for you know, brands, for in the context of global framework agreements, or in other contexts, the ITC, I know, is regularly um, taking opportunities to help to build sound industrial relations through this kind of training and through the kind of partnership that we're trying to develop through uh, good uh, sound workplace cooperation uh, mechanisms. 
So that's it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, back over to Silva. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thanks very much for that. Thanks also very much for being so punctual. It's not always the case with the first speaker. So it's good that we're already not uh, running after time. So thank you very much for this and to provide the over, uh, overview of what the ILO is doing. Uh, now I'm going to ask uh, my uh, colleague, John Richard, uh, to uh, take the floor. As I mentioned to you, John is working in the ILO office in Bangkok, more precisely in the ILO Decent Work Team for East and Southeast Asia and the Pacific as a Senior Social Dialogue and Labor Administration Specialist. And we ask uh, John to give us uh, an overview of what is happening uh, in some countries in Asia so that we can see uh, practically uh, at the ground, at the factory, at the enterprise level, how does uh, 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 workplace cooperation operates and, and what are some of the challenges. So thanks, uh, John. Uh, I don't see you right now online, but I guess you're going to be voice. I don't see your video on, but I guess you're going to be voice soon. Am I, uh, I show my video I show my video on, so don't, don't skip me. I can see you. <laughs> so thank you so much. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Sylvain, and uh, greetings to everyone. I have a number of friends and colleagues uh, in uh, uh, who are participating in this. So let me say hello to uh, all of you um, from uh, from Bangkok. Uh, can we go to the first slide? The next slide, please. So the um, the point of this brief presentation is really just to provide a, a an overview of what's happening in some selected uh, uh, countries in, in Asia. Uh, it is certainly not a comprehensive, um, but I hope to provide some flavor of what's happening. Uh, and also to show uh, how the, the way Chris set this up is very much uh, relevant for our work in Asia. Um, many of the uh, concerns that the committee in 1970 or 1971 uh, raised uh, are, are uh, quite valid uh, in, in this uh, region. Uh, so let me start, so the, the labor laws in, in most countries in Asia provide for some form of workplace cooperation. Um, the provisions are usually implemented in a formal sense but their effectiveness can vary a great deal depending on a number of factors that uh, we will uh, touch upon. Uh, and of course, the, these provisions reflect a range of uh, either colonial or other legal influences, uh, including um, in some cases, uh, advice from the ILO. Some of the keys to effective workplace cooperation that are relevant, not just for Asia, but uh, for any place uh, in the world, um, the ability to of, of workers in particular to exercise freedom of association uh, in in many countries we see uh, low levels of union density uh, and uh, anti-union behavior or I would say legal frameworks that make union activities uh, difficult to um, to realize um, we also face challenges around uh, kind of a traditional or hierarchical approach uh, among certain employers. When we are able to work with these employers uh, in improving uh, workplace cooperation, this often changes. Um, I think uh, my colleague Ann will touch upon some of these experiences as well. We have in a handful of countries specific legislation around export processing zones. Um, that uh, uh, lead to constraints um, on union uh, activities uh, and kind of change the complexion of workplace cooperation. And in uh, other countries, we see that adversarial industrial relations uh, in uh, generally um, can also uh, have an influence on effective workplace cooperation. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So this is really just a quick tour of a handful of countries in the region, uh, starting with Sri Lanka. Uh, they have a, 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 a defunct system of uh, workplace cooperation and state-owned enterprises that is no longer active. Uh, and in uh, export processing zones, uh, 
they have uh, something called employees councils uh, to promote uh, participation and decision making and for labor management consultation and cooperation. Uh, questions have been raised uh, whether these employees councils are being used just to pick up immediately on what Chris uh, said, whether these uh, councils are being used as a substitute for trade unions um, uh, and worker, uh, worker representatives. Um, private enterprise outside of export processing zones, there are no legal requirements uh, for uh, workplace cooperation arrangements, uh, but there are a number of individual initiatives. And the ILO has been working uh, with the tripartite constituents to try to build a system for workplace cooperation and private enterprises. Uh, so the ILO has been able to uh, help the constituents develop guidelines um, uh, through election of uh, workers' representatives. And we hope that these will be piloted uh, in the coming months uh, or into next year, depending on uh, whether the pandemic allows it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, staying in South Asia, uh, the <clears throat> Industrial Relations Code, which was recently revised in 2020, uh, but this provision pre-existed this uh, revision. Um, it provides for the establishment of a uh, works committee uh, in enterprises employing 100 more workers, uh, equal representation of workers uh, and employers, if a trade union is registered in that enterprise, uh, workers representatives will be nominated by the trade union. Uh, and also again, picking up on what uh, Chris uh, mentioned, uh, a long list of issues that the work, works committee uh, may not engage in, uh, including wages and benefits, but many other topics um, that are reserved for collective bargaining. And larger companies will have a hierarchy of committees uh, for different units, uh, different uh, uh, establishments within an enterprise, uh, and then uh, at the peak. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, Indonesia, uh, starting in 2003, made it mandatory for setting up uh, what they call LK, LKS bipartites uh, in all enterprises with uh, 50 or more employees. Uh, also, again, with, uh, with equal representation, um, uh, at least uh, three individuals on each side, but that can increase quite substantially depending on the size of the enterprise. This has become a very well established mechanism in Indonesia, as you can see, uh, Nearly 19,000 uh, bipartite committees have been established. And a number of ILO projects, uh, including uh, Better Work Indonesia, ha have engaged in ongoing efforts to, to increase the effectiveness uh, of, these, uh, of these committees, uh, various uh, capacity building uh, and other um, uh, efforts have, have been undertaken on a, on a regular basis uh, since, since 2003. Uh, next slide, please. The Philippines uh, provides for the right of workers uh, to participate in policy and decision-making uh, through what they call uh, labor management committees, uh, also called labor management councils if there's a union present. Uh, this voluntary forum uh, is uh, there to discuss uh, all matters of concern to workers, again, except those covered by collective bargaining. Uh, that's explicit in, in the legislation uh, and the implementing regulations. Um, in non-unionized enterprises, the Labor Management Committee is required for the purpose of formulating the gain sharing scheme under productivity incentives law. Uh, this is a law that was adopted that they're, I think, having a bit of uh, trouble trying to implement um, that incentivizes, or in some cases requires uh, that the uh, labor and management uh, develop a productivity, uh, sorry, a gain sharing scheme. Um, so I think they've, they've encouraged the establishment of this committee in order to uh, 
try to achieve the goals laid out in the legislation. Um, and just uh, some figures, uh, nearly 4,000 companies with LMCs, uh, 2,400 of which uh, don't have uh, unions. Um, so you can see, I mean, if for a country the size of the Philippines, it's, it's not uh, particularly widespread, um, but it has been taken up uh, to, uh, to a large extent. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, Thailand, again, uh, also requires uh, a welfare committee in uh, enterprises with 50 or more um, and uh, a minimum of five uh, employee representatives. This committee seems to, well, it does have a quite a broad uh, remit, um, provide advice, supervise, inspect, uh, and control the, the uh, welfare ar arrangements. Um, as you can see, 14,500 uh, uh, welfare committees have been registered. Um, but, and we'll come to this challenge again, when you have a private sector uh, trade union um, is organized in, in fewer than 1% of, uh, of enterprises, should be fewer than 1% of enterprises in the private sector. Um, so there are, fairly substantial challenges being faced by, by unions uh, in Thailand. The next slide, please. So just to, to conclude with some thoughts that I think we can try to take up in the, um, uh, in the group work. Uh, With the, the benefits of workplace cooperation have been well documented um, in terms of productivity, especially if it's effective workplace cooperation. Um, productivity increases, uh, uh, job satisfaction of, of workers, um, a very long list. But the challenges uh, that I want to pick up on are, are those that you know Chris laid out. And if we look at um, the trade union density uh, in in the countries that I listed, and this could also be extrapolated to a number of other countries in the region, uh, we have relatively low trade union density rates. Um, Thailand, the figure 3.5% also includes uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, that's why it's a private sector alone is, is much lower. Um, and so, one of the things I'd like us to think about is, you know, what, is, what does workplace cooperation mean for industrial relations in the absence of, of trade unions? And if we look at collective bargaining and the, the, the relationship between workplace cooperation and collective bargaining, um, we see in, in these same countries and across the region, the collective bargaining coverage uh, is, is even lower than the trade union density. And what are the, the impacts of workplace cooperation in the absence of collective bargaining? And can workplace cooperation be used to help promote collective bargaining? So those are some thoughts I wanted to leave you with and hopefully we can take them up again uh, in the group work. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, back to you, Silvan. Thank you very much, John. Thanks also very much for these last uh, questions. I think that uh, it would be uh, some of the points that we can discuss in the in the group work. And thanks for presenting uh, 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 this uh, specific example of countries and, and what is happening in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. So so thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce to you and to give the floor uh, to another ILO colleague. Uh, her name is Anne Zibard. She's working for the Better Work Program and um, she's a legal specialist. And uh, Anne will tell us what uh, the Better Work Program is and what it does specifically to promote workplace cooperation, encourage workplace cooperation in the different uh, countries where it operates. So. Uh, Welcome, Anne. Very good to have you on board, and uh, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, let me start by saying thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Um, and I am also looking forward to the discussions later in the in the breakout groups. Um, okay, if you could go to the next slide so we can jump right in. Um, first of all, um, just a little bit about what 
Better Work is for those who may be unfamiliar with the program. We are a partnership program of the International Labor Organization and the International Finance Corporation. And we focus our efforts primarily in the garment and, and footwear sectors, um, where we bring together a variety of stakeholders, uh, including governments, global brands, factory owners, um, unions, and workers. And basically, we're trying to improve the working conditions in the factories to increase the competitiveness and also to create a more equitable um, sector. Okie doke. Uh, next one. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, a little bit about where we are working. Um, we are currently in nine countries. So our largest programs are in Asia, that includes uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And we also have programs in Haiti and Nicaragua. And then in Africa, we are in Egypt and Ethiopia. And um, last but not least, Jordan. We also, we also have a program there. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay. A little bit about uh, the scope of the program. Um, we're currently working with over 150 brands. Um, we are in over 1,700 factories across those various um, country programs. And we estimate that, um, and we hope that um, among the, the workers and also their families in those factories that we are improving the lives of over 2 million people. Um, uh, this varies uh, considerably across the, the different countries, but on average across the countries, we see that about 80% of the workforce in the factories uh, where we have a presence is, is women. Okay, uh, next one. Um, and you can go one more actually. Okay, thanks. Um, so a little bit about how we work. Um, today, because the focus is on workplace co cooperation, I'm going to be really talking uh, for the most part about our work at factory level. But I also just want to mention that we also do work at the national and sectoral level um, in each of these countries. And um, that work involves often um, bringing together uh, tripartite constituents um, to facilitate uh, dialogue among them. And also, um, we actually, the program generates quite a bit of data. And so we can um, use that data to feed into national level policy um, discussions as well. Okie doke, uh, next slide. Okay, um, now just to get into a little bit more specifics about what, what we actually do. We provide uh, three different types of services and they're listed here. Um, first of all, we, um, we conduct assessments. So when we're doing our assessments, we are going into factories, um, looking at the working conditions and um, determining whether the factory is in compliance with the um, applicable legal requirements. Uh, the assessments are quite comprehensive. So we look at compliance with all of the fundamental rights, child labor, uh, for, well, the absence of child labor, <laughs> the absence of forced labor, uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining, and um, the absence of discrimination. And then we also look at um, basic working conditions, um, including compensation, um, contracts, related issues, also occupational safety and health and um, working hours. So we do these assessments um, to provide a sort of a snapshot of where the factory stands in terms of the compliance levels on all these issues and also to enable us to um, measure progress over time. And then we also, but no, not yet. <laughs> we also, um, we also provide, maybe I need to talk faster. <laughs> we also provide advisory services. So the advisory services, um, during the advisory services, we are working sort of in partnership with the factories to try to assist them in making improvements. 
And we do this through um, coaching, uh, facilitating of social dialogue, which I'm going to get to in, in a second in more detail, um, and providing techn technical advice. And then we also offer training services, and these are tailored to the needs of the factories um, based on what the challenges that we see during um, the assessment and also during the advisory services. Okay, Sylvan. Um, okay, now a little bit more on um, the advisory services because this is uh, really where our workplace cooperation efforts are focused. So um, when we start working with a factory, we want to make sure that um, we're not only talking with you know, the, the employer and the management side of the factory. We also want to be um, getting talk, talking and, and um, working with the union um, if there is one or more than one and if not with worker representatives. So um, if there is no existing committee in a factory, like we just heard from, um, from John that in, in many of these countries, there are legal requirements to form a committee, um, in which case we would work with the, the committee that's in place. Um, if there's no committee, then we would go about forming one. Um, if there's a union, then the union should basically be representing the worker side of the committee. Obviously, there are also management representatives in the committee. They should be in equal, equal numbers. And we, um, we initially provide a lot of training for the committee members to, um, to try to ensure that they're going to be able to function in the most effective way. Okay, next slide. Um, now, just to explain a little bit about uh, the kinds of work that we're doing with the committees. Um, initially, we do, and this is very early on when we just start to work with a factory, we go through a process that we call self-diagnosis. And this is, all of this is working with the committee. Um, so the self-diagnosis involves the workers and the, and the employer um, representatives on the committee identifying for themselves what they see as the challenges that the factory is currently facing. And um, this actually takes place before we do our assessment so that um, ideally they're identifying issues, including compliance challenges, and then addressing those before we um, go in and do the assessment so that they've already uh, actually corrected a few of the non-compliance areas. Um, the, you know, we, we encourage regular meetings of the committees. Uh, normally, our enterprise um, advisors are going into the factories and working on site with the committees. And we also develop improvement plans. So the improvement plans outline the issues where uh, progress is needed. And they include the issues that are identified through the self-diagnosis and then also through the assessments. And then just to mention, um, uh, during the past year, basically now, it's been a year, I guess, um, obviously COVID has presented so many challenges for I'm sure everybody on this, um, in this meeting. Um, it's been quite challenging for us to try to figure out how we can continue to work with the bipartite committees. Um, a lot of the focus during the past year has been on occupational safety and health. And, um, also working to develop guidelines that will, we, we, we sort of figured that there were gonna be a lot of, of um, layoffs um, that were gonna be brought about due to the pandemic. And so we, de uh, we developed guidance for um, factories to hopefully enter into consultations with the unions or worker representatives and um, either uh, find a way not to um, engage in layoffs or to um, to do it in the in a responsible and fair manner. Okay, next slide. Um, I think I covered already the first point here. This is just a tiny bit more on what we have been doing during COVID. Um, it's a, and these are honestly just a couple of examples. We've needed, for, for you know, obvious reasons, we've needed to switch in large part to working remotely as opposed to working in the factories. And that's 
presented a variety of challenges. Um, we've also worked um, where possible through others. And it's great, we have some Better Work Bangladesh colleagues on here who maybe can talk about this in more detail later. But um, Better Work Bangladesh did a training of trainers, sorry for all the acronyms here, <laughs> training of trainers for um, Ministry of Labor um, officials on workplace cooperation and grievance mechanisms. And then those trained officials are gonna go out and do this training in um, over 400 factories. And uh, the, the great thing here is that they're obviously not only focused in the garment sector as we are. So the, the reach is, is expanded considerably. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so um, we've seen a few things um, that make the committees work well. And it's so interesting, Chris, that slide that you had up on the guidance that they produced in 1970, I think it was, for recommendation 94. Um, it's, all, it's all ringing true. We, we have um, learned these things through, uh, through research that has actually looked at the data and, and come to the very same conclusions actually as, as so many of the items that were on that list. So um, the four um, primary things of importance are uh, elect, represent, protect, and empower. So just go through these um, pretty quickly. So elect refers to free elections with secret ballots. Of course, if there are unions, they already have elected officials representing workers. They would be the ones um, to serve on the committees. Also, um, we have found that having a proportion of women on the committee that's reflective of the proportion of women in the workforce is extremely helpful and also increases the um, effectiveness of these committees. Um, represent, by this we mean, I think I saw this on your slide as well, um, by this we mean there needs to be really good communication between the representative the workforce at large and then yeah, of course going back up to the committee so that um, the representatives are collecting information from the workforce in terms of what their concerns are and then feeding it back into the committee discussing them and hopefully coming up with solutions and then going back to the workforce so that they know actually what's happening. Um, okay, next slide. Protect this, I also noticed this on your slides. Um, so this is uh, ensuring that there's no retaliation against um, the, the worker or union representatives that are on the committee. Um, one thing I'll just mention, uh, when we start to work with a factory, or I should say before we actually start to work with them, we do enter into um, terms and conditions with the factories. And among those terms is a commitment on the part of the factory that they will not retaliate against any of the workers that basically that we are interacting with in any way. So that would include um, the worker representatives on the committee, but also even if we're just interviewing people during an assessment. So we require that committee on the part of the factories. And then finally, and this was also on your slide, Chris, um, empower. So this really gets to the importance of unions um, ensuring, first of all, that um, if, there, if there are unions, that they are basically the committee and um, not using the committees in ways that might disempower unions in any way. So of course, that means the mandate of the committee is limited and not, uh, not sort of uh, expanding into areas where unions should be primarily um, working. And um, we have found also through the research that um, managers feel that the committees are actually more effective um, when there are unions on the committees. Okay, next slide. I think I just have this and one more. So, um, this is just a little bit about the findings. John alluded already to some of these. Um, first of all, we've seen, and this is also based on research. There's been quite a bit of research that's been done. Um, we've seen that this, uh, factories that have good quality mechanisms for social dialogue in place, the, the workers um, say that they are healthier 
Um, there's less verbal abuse in these factories and there's better problem solving, um, which makes sense because it's no longer just the, you know, the employers and the managers sitting around trying to come up with solutions. There's actually a broader um, range of perspectives that can be, that can be brought to, to bear. Um, also increases in productivity. John already alluded to this. Um, this is uh, in part based on reduced turnover that we see in factories that have good, you know, well-functioning social dialogue. Um, and also reduce reductions in the numbers of disputes, which of course take time away from operations. We've also found that um, a well-functioning social dialogue is a good predictive indicator of sustained compliance. So we don't see backsliding like we do in some, in some factories um, as much when there is well-functioning social dialogue. Okie doke, I think it's the last slide coming up, yes. I already mentioned this a little bit. So um, normally when there's better communication in the factory, we see a lower number of industrial uh, disputes. And just to mention one, one, one more time uh, with a little bit more detail. So when women, as I mentioned, are on, on the committee uh, in a, uh, and reflecting the proportion of women in the actual workforce, um, there, we find that there's a better working environment in the factory, there's less sexual harassment, reduced uh, verbal abuse, and also uh, lower levels of discrimination. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Thank you very much for this and very, uh, for explaining what uh, a Better Work uh, program is about and what are the findings of your experience in working with uh, uh, the, the countries you mentioned. So I uh, think it's going to also uh, fuel the discussions we're going to have in a few minutes. I would also say that there have been some questions raised on the chat box regarding uh, EPZ, regarding workers' representations, regarding uh, freedom of associations, collective bargaining efficiency. So I also encourage you to look at the chat box because uh, especially Chris has been answering to many of these questions. So um, there's been some of these, uh, uh, some answers or some comments given to uh, to these questions. So thanks very much for introducing the work of uh, of uh, in of the ILO in some in some uh, in some regions. I would like now to show you uh, this new uh, ILO tool, this new ITC ILO tool, which has been uh, recently developed. Uh, and um, I'm not gonna uh, go as uh, long as I did. Last last week, because I think that some people have already been. But I would like just to very quickly introduce to you what the Industrial Relations Global Toolkit is about. This is a global set of training materials for the promotion of sound industrial relations that covers the different thematic areas that you can see on the screen, from collective bargaining to gender non-discrimination, violence, and harassment. And the aim of the toolkit is to provide to our constituents and to our colleagues well updated um, training materials, activities, uh, PowerPoint games that they can use in order to build the capacity of employers, workers, government representatives, and uh, to promote sound relation. Uh, the Industrial Relations Global Toolkit is based on the ILO experience uh, in uh, the country level over the last years, and we've been compiling and producing new materials uh, to try to answer to the best that we can to uh, some of the new challenges that uh, workplaces and uh, employers and workers are, are facing. So among those uh, is obviously the questions of the accessibility of training and the questions of how can we continue uh, developing and how can we continue expand our outreach and how can our message still can uh, com be conveyed to the workplaces even when we cannot physically uh, go to the uh, places or where we cannot conduct face-to-face uh, -face training. So one of our answers is actually uh, the digitalization of our, uh, of our, our training. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, what the workplace cooperation self-learning e-tool uh, looks like. But just before, for those of you that have never been accept, uh, uh, accessing before, this is the first page of the ITC online, uh, uh, the ITC ILO eCampus. Uh, if you have not registered, you can create an account for free. 
uh, you will be asked to uh, connect and you will be asked to um, uh, use your credentials once you have an account. And uh, you will be able um, on the uh, eCampus then to access a catalog of, of training. Some trainings are accessible only to those participants, but some training are available for everyone. And uh, this is the case of uh, the uh, Industrial Relations Global Toolkit that is accessible uh, for any users of the, uh, e, uh, of the e campus. So under your courses page, you will be able to access the Industrial Relations Global Toolkit that will give you uh, uh, some, in, uh, some explanation about how to use it and what to find and, 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 and will provide you with some information regarding methodology and how to use uh, the toolkit and some icebreakers which are linked to industrial relations. And then you will be able to access the topics uh, 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 menu. I just did a very quick screenshot. It does not cover all uh, the different areas that can be accessible, but uh, and some will be added in the forthcoming weeks. But uh, by clicking uh, on this link, you can uh, uh, access the different uh, the different topics. What happens if you click on one on these links? For example, a workplace cooperation. You will be able to access two things. The first thing is uh, what you see at the back: the workplace cooperation units which means that for uh, different uh, topics on workplace cooperation, you will be able to access training activities that you can use, that you can take to train your members, your constituency, or if you're an ILO official, for example, the ILO constituents, and it will give you uh, ready to use uh, training materials that you can use to construct and to design your own training facilities. But you can also, and this is one of our responses uh, to uh, the crisis, you can also use the self-guided e-learning tool that you can access uh, very easily and that will give you a chance to, um, uh, to, um, to, um, to, 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 to get, to, 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 to get exposed and to get trained or to be uh, able to use it or so in face-to-face -face training on workplace cooperation. I'm just going to ask you a little bit of patience because I'm going to stop sharing my screen a second just for you to show what it looks like in practice, but I have to disconnect a second. So just a few seconds for you to wait while I launch. Oh. Okay. Okay, I think you can sorry. Okay, I think you can see it now. So I think that you can see it on my screen. Andrea, can you uh, confirm by noting that you can see it? Good. And uh, so uh, with your uh, free uh, uh, eCampus users uh, credential, you can start getting introduced to the different modules on uh, the toolkit. You can start uh, uh, getting exposed to what it is. You can get some uh, information on, for example, different ways that workplace cooperation is working by clicking on some examples. And uh, by accessing the toolkit, you will be able to basically get trained and uh, get, uh, for example, uh, more information on the difference or the relationship between collective bargaining and, uh, and workplace cooperation. So this is a tool that people can use. This is a tool that can be uh, individually, that people can also uh, uh, use uh, um, um, they, that they can also use uh, in group or that they can also use, for example, at factory level, uh, you can see that there are some examples, that there are some scenarios that people can watch and that they can answer. It's quite interactive. It's sometimes uh, we try to make it also a, a bit funny. And uh, we, uh, we believe that it's a good way for people to get uh, more information, for example, about uh, the different elements of recommendations uh, 129. There are some guides, some exercises about effective meetings or how to make workplace cooperation gender sensitive. 
and uh, uh, we will post and we will send you again uh, the, the, um, the, the link for this toolkit so that, for example, you can uh, get more information. You can uh, possibly also send it to uh, different people that might be interested to, uh, to, to look at it. So this is what the workplace corporations self-learning tool is about. As I mentioned to you, it is accessible uh, online at, um, at, uh, at any time. So we also hope that we will be able to um, reach more people and that we will be able to uh, expand uh, uh, the number of people that are exposed to the ILO message regarding workplace cooperation. So Andrea, I think we can confirm, we'll send you again the link so that you can have a chance. And we encourage everyone to share it uh, with the people you know that might be interested. So uh, thanks, thanks everyone. And uh, let's continue actually uh, by, uh, so any questions can be raised with my colleague Irene de Orsola. We will post also uh, the questions, uh, uh, email address on the chat box uh, so that you can, uh, you can reach her if you have any difficulty. 